Okay, let's have some fun today. Not that all scenes aren't fun, but we're going to be doing a little bit of an experiment here in this stamp along. A lot of you have um, photo paper, okay? Inkjet, your standard style of a uh, inkjet printer paper. If you have glossy cardstock, you can also use that, but uh, I'm going to be doing a test on this photo paper, which I've done before in my standard kind of glossy cardstock dye-based ink layered style of stamping and uh, the glossy cardstock is a little bit stickier it has that emulsion coating so everything's drying really fast so that's going to make things a little bit harder when you're doing that type of technique on here so we're going to be using more of our alcohol pens on this um, scene okay so what you're going to need you'll start off with your covered bridge stamp you can work around some other type of image I'm going to be doing some filler with my maple pear here and then we're going to be doing some foreground types of imagery you can substitute other types of uh, foreground elements I'll be using my reeds um, some of my leaves stamped 399 all the codes for these stamps are in the description below on all the uh, videos and we have our sedge filler stamp right here I might put in something else too like a fence or something like that in the foreground but we'll get to that when we get to it okay okay so on photo paper what I'm going to be using is standard dye based ink okay now I just ink this whole thing up just with black okay now you can use other colors and have them inherent in the impression themselves if you have some dye-based markers okay the plumes tombos those types of things i'm using the marvy brush markers everyone used to use these back in the day i don't know if uh, people have these anymore or whatever if you're kind of if you got into stamping in the last even 10 years I don't know how many people are doing that but we used to just color right onto the stamps like this and then we would stamp them out and then they would have inherent color in the impressions okay a lot of people do more of kind of a black style of a uh, um, impression these days and then they just do the coloring in after it which looks great too but I'm just going to throw in some of these tones now this one's like a olive brown you can put in some fall types of colors into those trees if you want to some uh, oranges whatnot I would keep it fairly dark though because we will be doing most of our coloring later so I'm just going in here this stamp right here is a covered bridge of course um, I'm putting a little bit of brown into that black and yes I am going light over dark okay I tend to like that I think it kind of blends things together a little bit more but you can also just do straight black if you want to okay all right, now I'm going to position this somewhere kind of in the upper area. You can even have it going off your paper, okay? So it'll be something like this up here, okay? I, may, I think I'll have my trees going a little bit off the top of the paper. It doesn't matter where you have it. If you stamp a little bit lower, a little bit higher, much lower, much higher, it doesn't really matter. It'll matter kind of in terms of our additional imagery but you know it's not no area is going to be right or wrong okay so there's a lot of tolerance if not an infinite number of to level of tolerance in terms of our um, placement okay now this stamp right here is the large version so you want to get a good coverage in terms of your pressure on this don't just stamp like this on the outside have pressure right in the middle too okay and I usually have a stack of paper underneath my things if you're stamping with a stamp positioner or platform you know you'll have that cushion underneath but give it uh, a lot of coverage in terms of your impression um, or your pressure quality okay all right now immediately on my photo paper here I can tell it was really sticky so when I was doing that when I peeled it up it felt like I was peeling off a, like almost like a sticker it's because it has that emulsion coating on there so that being said a lot of times I don't know let me see right here yeah it's there's a little bit of moisture on there but just in general I think it tends to um, I don't know what it does it, it absorbs inks really fast and it kind of puts that emulsion to a little bit of a um, kind of like a, a liquid or some or a gel or something like that 
Okay, now I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in now on this stamp right here, this there's a road coming out from here this way, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my sedge filler stamp like this, and I'm going to continue that road out that way, okay? See how I added that down? Now I'll add some more of this right out here, like so, okay? I'll put another one right up here. So what I did was I filled in all of this area right here, okay? And then we have this little area right here. Now, if you don't have the maple pear, you could just take these trees right here, and you can kind of mask off um, some of your area down here and stamp those trees, okay? I'm just going to go with my maple pear here. Now watch my masking, okay? You just take a ripped paper towel, or a torn paper towel, or whatever, and I'm going to mask off that grass that I stamped right there, okay? Just like so. And I ink this whole stamp up, but I probably won't be stamping those areas down there, okay? And I'll just go right over this like so. I'm going into the stamp a little bit over here. I don't want to go into it like one inch or something like that. I'd be stamping it in front of the, uh, you know, the opening. So it's, it'll be right over here somewhere. Okay, don't be afraid of going over those trees, but if you get space in between trees, that's no big deal either. It's not like, oh my gosh, you know, a tree would never be there. Okay, go something like that. And if you want to go for a little bit of extra, kind of masking, kind of a... Uh, practice, then what we do is we move this up and I'll mask off these trees. Have a little bit of the trees showing though. Eighth of an inch to a quarter inch or so. A lot of tolerance, okay? And I'll be stamping probably about the top half of these trees, like right about right here. Okay? So see how that really fills in right there? I mean, it looks like one continuous tree, doesn't it? It's because this is overlapping into this tree down below, the, the tree impression, so it just merges in there. It could be that there's a tree right here, and this one's in the background, 20 feet, or it could be one continuous tree. It just depends on what you want. If you want it to look farther back, then we're just going to mask that off and color that in a little bit of a different color than this foreground one. Or if it's the same continuous tree, then you just treat it all the same. So there's all kinds of variation and none of it's right or wrong, and you can also decide on those types of little fine details later on. Okay, so we're going to be coloring this in. Now, a lot of times when I'm doing this on glossy cardstock, I'm putting in these vast, kind of swooshy areas of color everywhere, a lot of saturation, and we'll do the same thing, but we're going to leave a lot of our coloring to our um, alcohol pens, okay? And a lot of you have a vast array of alcohol pens, Copics, whatever. I typically, I, I use a cheap brand. <laughs> but I find the quality of the ink is actually the same, but the brush tips are probably better on the Copics. Um, all right, let's take a look at this. Let's just go with your traditional colors of a uh, noonday or something like that in autumn, okay? There's, these are trees are deciduous. You can do it in spring where they're all green if you want to. If you have some different um, um, values of your kind of autumn colors, go ahead and use those too. So there's no set formula here, okay? But here's the thing that I'm going to do here. Instead of just going with all um, markers, alcohol markers, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in kind of a, a base layer of a little bit of um, dye base inks, okay? And what I'll do is I'll kind of establish a lighting scheme with it, okay? So this one happens to be antique linen. I'm going to suggest some light shade. A lot of you have distress inks, okay? If you have some kind of tan memento or something like that, that would work out fine too. Or if you have Marvies and whatnot, you can use those. Um, kind of in the lighter shade, okay? Tea dye, old paper, um, antique linen. If you have Marvy pads, you can go with like a pale orange. Memento, there's um, 
desert sand, those types of things, okay? But this, what this is going to do is I'm going to kind of establish a uniform kind of foundational color throughout this area. And I don't expect this to go on really smoothly either, okay? It's, um, this emulsion paper really grabs that dye-based ink, the water-based inks, and it dries really fast, okay? And when I'm applying my inks, it kind of gets a little bit, it feels like it's a little bit sticky. Okay, now, <laughs> I'm looking for a uh, wand here. I need to go wash my wands. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm sitting here kind of uh, um, getting the ink out of my uh, stylus tool here. Okay, so whatever applicator you're using, uh, you know, probably clean it off pretty good. A lot of times I don't even bother doing that, but since I'm doing a video right here, I don't want to go into antique linen here and it's, I start to apply and it looks green or something like that from the blue that was on there. But get a good dollop of this. Okay, now here's the thing. When you we're applying this into the trees, covered bridge, the road, everywhere down here, all right? or in all areas and objects. It doesn't mean that I'm going to color everything uniformly. What we're going to do is we're just going to start applying this, okay? I kind of apply it in a light touch. Now, if you're using a darker in color ink, inherently darker ink, then you'll be a little bit more careful. But what this is also doing here in some ways is I'm going kind of establishing a lighting scheme in here, okay? And you do that, I do it, with a, my lightest color, okay? So, well, where it should be light and dark in here, just in general. Okay, well, on the covered bridge, now I'm going with a very light tone, so I, I mean, I could color this whole thing right here and just reserve um, kind of some areas um, with, you know, that will be done with my darker colors for certain areas. Uh, let me, let me go back. <laughs> okay, I could color this whole thing like this, but just don't color it uniformly like that with, you know, the darker colors that we go with, okay? But if you're starting with this antique linen is really quite light in value, even in, in its full saturation, okay? But I am leaving some areas just as is, okay? So in other words, don't see this as like a harder thing to do in terms of your considerations. It's, it's in reality, lighting is just coloring less, okay? Now don't worry about a super smooth application of this either. You're just kind of going for a, just a general kind of application of this, okay? Now, watch me when I do this on the road, okay? And it doesn't matter where you do it, but just leave some areas of white, okay? If you look up here, there's some areas of these trees that are a little bit white. It doesn't have to be the top part, doesn't have to be the bottom part. Just have a little bit of variation, and that's typically what lighting looks like. It doesn't fall on everything uniformly. There's shadows being cast by different objects here and there and whatnot. And this is, again, this is just providing a general base coat. Okay, now in your grass area right here, to the left of the road, just retain some areas of light, okay, within that space, or just don't apply it completely uniformly. Now, now, for a lot of people coming from certain styles of coloring, okay, they're used to approaching everything in, within a given space or a certain object uniformly. So um, they would see this row of trees as something to be colored green or orange or whatever if it's autumn. Okay, so they'll color everything up completely uniformly the same value, okay? So 
or this covered bridge will be all the same, okay? So that's what we're going to be practicing right here, or exercising. We're going to be defining forms through the use of value, but that's also going to be representative of lighting, okay? All right, so let's go into that. Just with this same ink right here, I'm going to apply some of this, or a little bit more of it. I did apply some to the rooftop, but I'm applying more of it on the side of the bridge. So I'm just getting a f more full saturation and by coloring that side of that bridge darker it makes it look like it's more three-dimensional because it's lighter on the top, okay? And I, I mean I, I might put a little bit more here. Now remember this is, uh, this is just kind of some preliminary colors that we're going to be doing here. We're going to be applying most of our colors using um, alcohol pens. I've been really having a lot of fun playing around with alcohol pens and alcohol blends. Okay. Alright, so I'm just kind of following my initial kind of color scheme down here, or inking scheme, lighting scheme, it's defining light through the use of color in this case. But see this right here where I have these little patchy areas like that? That's your lighting right there. So if you retain those lighter areas that you're establishing throughout your coloring that you're going to be doing, you'll it'll look as though there is light within your you know your scene here. When we start applying darker colors and we cover all that up, we lose our light, okay? So if you retain these areas of light that you've established, you'll be you'll be fine as far as lighting goes. So in other words, when we move into kind of our medium and darker tones, we'll just kind of avoid certain areas, okay? But we can kind of see the lighting scheme kind of coming about. I'm leaving this area down here in the water for kind of my blue tones. But you can come in there with a little bit of this tone too, just as kind of a... A neutral. It's really not neutral. It's kind of warmish, but even if you put some of that down there, it, it looks pretty good in the in the the water. When you're going with really light tones, they're very very um, forgiving as far as the blending of colors go because it's such a light value of it. If I was going with a dark charcoal, you know, chocolate brown or something like that, and putting it down there in the water, it's harder to work around. You can't blend in those darker tones very easily. All right, now just in general, usually at the base of trees and things like that, objects, large objects in a scene, I'll put a little bit more tone at the bottom of it. Now, see, I'm just taking my applicator like this, and I'm using it on a side. I'm not using the whole thing. I'll just kind of put a little bit of tone at the base of these trees and it looks like it's casting a shadow more because you have more ink at the base like that. I'm just kind of spread it around a little bit. See, I'm kind of tapping it around like that. And so see this right here at the base of my trees, it's darker, right? Just because I simply have more ink. All right, so that is that. You can go with more you know, more of your tones if you have them. I'm just going to move on just for the sake of kind of simplification here. I'm not going to get into too much of that. We'll get into our inky. Now if you have a really pale um, green of some sort, like the peeled paint, oh, Memento has pear tart. There's a um, pale green Marvy pad, something like this. These ones are a lot warmer in, in tone or in temperature. Um, but you can use one of those. Okay, so I'm just going to use my same tip right here. Now for this, I'm going to start dabbing it down, get a kind of a feel for it, start it in a little area. And I'll put some of it in my grass, okay? Don't put it everywhere just kind of spread it around a little bit but now now here's the thing too do you notice how I'm kind of staying in one little area and I'm working it I'm not going like this all the way around okay so I'm just kind of I, I, you get a little bit of a smoother application when you kind of stay in an area like this not just like this in one uniform place like that what I'm doing is I'm kind of doing this and I'm, see I'm kind of moving this around a little bit so I get that tapered of smoother transition okay 
just right here, just kind of work a small area, and I'm going with a very light touch to uh, kind of the analogy that I make sometimes is just imagine you're applying kind of makeup on your face or a child's face or something like that. You know, if it's a child's face, you'd kind of do a little bit more delicately and just kind of tap around and you know, it's like think of it like a powder that you're applying. Now see this right here? You can kind of see my lighting within that grass a little bit more, can't you? Because I'm going a little bit darker, so there's a little bit more contrast, so it's a little bit more apparent. Now there's some grass on the other side of the road too. So I'm going in there like that. This is a different feel from glossy cardstock, okay? This one's, it's grabbing my ink faster, okay? Now I can work around that type of feel by just using a lighter touch like this, okay? Because if it's grabbing my ink, I don't want to go like that and get this hard shape of my applicator, whatever applicator you happen to be using. Um, for those of you who might not have like a stylus tool, this is a very convenient, very comfortable tool. Okay, it feels it's you hold it like a pen. But let's say I was using something like, you know, a cosmetic sponge or something like this. Okay, you can work around something like this, or you can be using you know those cosmetic brushes, makeup brushes, as well. But this is a pretty good tool too. And see, I'm just applying this ink. Matter of fact, maybe this is even better for, you know, really hard edge objects like that top of that roof right there, but I can get right in there and color in my trees like that. Now don't I'm not forgetting about my autumn. This green looks great um, with your autumn type of color scheme kind of mixed in there. Alright, now as I'm using something like this though, you know, I'm see I can use that little corner of it too. So remember, kind of not uniform, go a little bit more kind of irregular in terms of your coloring, because see you now this tree has a little bit of light in it and a little bit of dark. Okay. That's the that, that's that's the hardest thing um, for people to do sometimes um, is to not color everything completely mono value, okay? When you have changes of value within a given space, it looks like light is hitting it kind of in different ways. So just kind of observe, you know, um, observe your scene and you can see it kind of getting a little bit darker. Some areas are, you know, are lighter than others. Okay. Just something like this. Sometimes I get caught up in it too, and uh, you know I'll be using my stylus tools, and uh, I don't know. Sometimes maybe I should, you know, it's just like any painter working on a certain painting. I should like Van Gogh working with a palette knife or whatever he used. Um, uh, you use certain different tools for you know, their strengths. So maybe if you want need a hard edge, you know, type of thing, then you would use something like this. In addition to this, so why not use all? Use the, all, everything. Use their makeup brushes too, or whatever. Okay, so we have that kind of established right there. We have a lot of things already colored in, right? All right, let's hit some uh, markers. All right, now what kind of color markers are you going to use? Okay, now a lot of you have like all of your markers beautifully arranged and maybe you pull them out one at a time or whatever. Mine are just kind of in, you know, the kind of the holders that they came with. So I'm not really worried about kind of my organization of them. But if you want to pull them out one at a time, you can do that. I'm just pulling out kind of some examples of some colors that I think would look pretty good in here. All right, so you notice these kind of, kind of, you know, your earthy tones, you know, your greens, your browns, and whatnot. Uh, I want to go into a little bit more of a bolder colors, too, like in my grasses, so I can move into kind of, this is a lettuce green here, all the different 
companies have different um, naming conventions. Let's move into some oranges. I'm not going to use all of these. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm pulling these out as kind of examples right here that we'll be using. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'll go into like a really bright like Christmas green or something like that, but I, I can. All right, now these pens right here, some of these are Marvy Plumes and some of these are called Shuttle Art. This Shuttle Art brand is this really cheap brand. They're about 40 cents a pen or so. Double-sided. They don't have the brush tip though. And the La Plumes only are come in one side and that's only brush tip. But anyways, I find alcohol inks, alcohol inks. Like I said, the brush, the, the tips are a little bit nicer in some uh, brands than others, but uh, I don't know. The way that I use them, it really doesn't matter because I do so much blending, okay? All right, so I think you get the idea, right? Of these colors. Don't ask, hey, what was that third color you were using? You know, if you have anything close, you know, that'll do fine. Okay, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to grab some of these, or, and I'm just going to go with some of my lighter tones. We worked with very light tones to begin with right here. And I'm going to do the same thing. Here's a pastel peach, for example. This peachish color is kind of... It's kind of like a, a lighter version of brown, right? So let's put this into some areas of our house. Where, where do you do it? Well, I'm doing it kind of in the, uh, the darker areas. It's, this is not a dark color by any means, but I'm going to build up into my darker colors, all right? Everyone uses these differently. And they're people that are much, much more accomplished at um, coloring than I am with, you know, your alcohol markers, your Copic markers and whatnot. Um, I would put pretty much everyone <laughs> that uses them as being more accomplished than I am, as I was saying that. Um, that occurred to me because I'm just kind of playing around with these in terms of the coloring. I do a lot of like little tiny things usually when I'm doing dye based inks and I just do a little bit of coloring with these. I'll, I'll color in small objects that aren't really conducive to color in with a big, you know, a wider, you know, applicator. Little people, shirts of people, figures, um, houses, shadows, shading of rocks and whatnot. But anyways, see what I'm doing? I'm just I'm just going in here and coloring in some of these trees a little bit more. You see that little tinge of that color in there? And I colored in some areas of my rooftop here. Let's bring it into this area of the grass as well, okay? I find this kind of sticky and a little bit... It, it's grabbing my pen a little bit. Not hard or anything like that, but I can definitely feel that emulsion of the paper, okay? The surface of this. Alright. You don't have to put it everywhere. I'm not coloring everything. But do you see where kind of this kind of warm glow is starting to happen? I'm just going on with one color so far. You can see it right here. You see that kind of warm tinge in there? That's how you kind of get these nice kind of... Or I try to get these nice... Um, kind of transitions and color glows working in my pieces. I was going to say that's how I get it, but... You know, these kind of things that I'm doing, they're kind of experiments. I, I mean, I know the theory of it. I'm just kind of checking out to see if it worked. All right, this is apricot. Let's see what color this is. Maybe this is almost a, a lighter color than that previous one. Now, this is a brush marker, so it gives me a little bit more coverage. These other shuttle art fine tips are kind of more, you know, like a tiny little point than this brush one right here. And these ones are a little bit hard, but they work the same to me. This feels better going on the brush marker, you know, but I, I don't complain at, uh, you know, that uh, 40 cents a pen, you know, for those other ones. So if there's some colors that, you know, your favorite colors, maybe get in the better pen, 
um, but maybe you just want to get some supplementary ones. You can get these 80 pen sets for $40. Some of it's like cheaper now. It's like 100 pens for uh, $40. And you get might get some colors that you might not be using too often, but hey, you can kind of supplement. All right, so anyways, coloring in like so. See, I'm getting some of this under the road as well. Colors, analogous colors on the color wheel. Um, when you put them next to another, one another, they create a color glow. Analogous colors are colors that are next to each other. So what we're doing is we're actually putting colors next to each other, but we're kind of filling in too. But you see that? See how it's kind of coming up? I mean, it's really subtle, right? And if you work kind of really incrementally like that, if you don't jump from one really light color to a really dark color, it's really very, you know, kind of methodical and easy to do because things are just kind of happening very slowly, okay? Now watch right here in my trees right here. I'm kind of hitting, this isn't a super dark color by any means. It's more of a medium tone, but it is darker than what I'm applying. So I'm applying it into my darker areas. Well, where are the darker areas? Well, in the trees, you can see there are darker areas within the form, right? And so the, I'm just kind of hitting in some of those areas. It, it's not hard, you know, and fixed, but that's kind of the general area that I'm doing uh, with this pen. Now, <laughs> I'm looking at this. I think that I, I need to go on the side of this, so let's get a little bit more bold, and let's hit this color. Eh, it's, okay, it's not too much darker, but you know how to do it all the same. I kind of colored it fairly uniformly, but now look at that. That looks like a different side right here. But look at this E right here. There's a little bit of a shadow in the design, right? So I've included a lot of shadows and things like that in the designs, and you can just kind of follow suit. So if you're kind of get observant and look at where I've added shadows in the design, you can just kind of follow suit with that. So like underneath that Eve, see I put that shadow in there. So doesn't that look more three-dimensional that way? So just look at the forms. You don't have to think about things theoretically. You just have to look and be observant and say, okay, there's a little bit of a darker area right here. Okay, now as I hold my paper right here like this, it's getting sticky. Um, you know, that alcohol ink kind of starts building up on that emulsion and it starts to get this kind of sticky consistency. That's fine though. That's what we want. We want these alcohol inks to build up somewhat because of what we'll be doing with them um, later on. Okay, there's some shadows down here in the grass. I can bring in some of this brown down here, too. We'll start going a little bit more green grass down here, but having some of this kind of uniform related color in all these areas, that's going to help in terms of the continuity between all of these different areas. Let's see what this one is. This one's a pale yellow, okay? Maybe this will start to brighten things up a little bit, okay? Go up here into your trees. This one's a kind of brighter color. You can bring it into your shadows or in the lighter areas because it's very light. Now remember where you go over with yellow, it doesn't it isn't necessarily going to make that area yellow if you're going over brown with it. Okay. It'll just some I, I I say that kind of with a little bit of an asterisk because when we do go back over alcohol inks, darker ones, lighter ones on most types of paper, maybe not so much on matte cardstock, but on kind of glossy or on photo paper like this, that alcohol ink kind of sits on the surface, so when we go over it with a lighter color, it kind of makes that other color that we've already laid down, it makes it go back into solution, and it can be removed in to some degree. Okay, so we have that right there. It warmed it up a little bit, didn't it? Okay, let's, get, let's start moving into um, some other... Uh, more of a greeny, you know, greenish tinge green. Let's see what this one is. Uh, lettuce green, okay. 
I started up in my shadow areas. Okay, bring it down like that. Kind of use it here and there. It's really bright. I'm not going to use this one everywhere, I don't think, because it is really, really bright. Boy, that is really bright now, huh? Okay, I'm going to put this in my trees a little bit here and there. That green will mix really well with things like orange and whatnot. <laughs> I have my finger there. It's almost, it feels like glue or something like that sticking in my finger. Not a super tacky glue or anything like that, but, uh, you know, it, it definitely has a little bit of that consistency. Uh, spearmint. Let's try this one. Any kind of, like a pale green, maybe. See that right there? Okay. Okay, I like this green right here. I think this will be really nice down here. And I'll... It's fairly light, so... I'll use a pretty good portion of it. I'm trying to retain some of my later areas down here as well. Okay. And maybe I'll put a little bit in my trees here and there. It's more of a tr like a true green. The other ones were kind of like halfway between yellow and green. Okay, see that? See that variation happening within this space? Okay, now as I'm working through this, don't worry about it, something not blending well. Mine doesn't look, mine looks a little splotchy. Alright, this is apple green, kind of like a real greenish, bright, it's almost like a neon green or something like that. It's kind of fun building it up and watching this kind of develop like that, huh? Um, I've been doing it over um, photos before, so this is kind of a different experience, just going straight coloring right here. This one starts getting a little bit darker. Let's see, this is a jungle green. Let's take a look at that green's going to be. It's quite a jump in value, isn't it? So let's kind of hit it down here in the shadows. It's not going on completely smooth. It's, it's kind of real blobby, but what we do, don't worry about that. And I said don't worry about it before because what we're going to do is when we go into our darker colors like this, we're going to go back in with our lighter colors again to blend out these darker forms, okay? And if it looks splotchy and whatnot, we're just, you know, that'll be fine. You'll use that splotchiness as texture in your piece, okay? Now, the darker colors I don't use quite as much. I start using it kind of in shadow areas, like at the base of my trees or whatnot. See that right there? I mean, it's just a straight line, so it's not, you know, applying very nicely at all. It's just kind of working as shadow. And you can kind of hit these areas right back in here. If I kind of make my areas around my um, bridge a little bit darker, it makes it stand out. Um, of the scene, it kind of makes it pop a little bit, as we used to call, say in art classes. See like that? You color in the background a little bit darker, that bridge pops out a little bit more. Okay, so let's see. Let's start approaching the bridge a little bit more. It's starting to look kind of... When you don't do kind of the same applications of kind of resolve in all areas, it makes one area stand out. So see, the road right here is, and the bridge is looking a little anemic just because 
you know, the other areas are just kind of becoming much, much richer. So don't worry about that. You know, we haven't forgotten about that. We were just kind of working within that kind of that value range in the trees there. All right, this is a biscuit, okay? It's kind of really like that pale orange. You can go back to that one, but I'm just... You have to kind of readjust, you know, seeing how certain areas get. Okay, now watch this right here. I'm going to spread this around a little bit with this color right here, so I'm just kind of going into it, and it kind of melts it almost. It's not melting it, but it's just kind of making it go back into solution, that darker form. And see, I'm just kind of taking that and I'm spreading that around that darker color like so okay see right there so it's kind of spreading around and it looks a little bit more kind of incorporated with the surrounding areas that's what I really like about these alcohol inks you kind of have to work with them though I mean sometimes I want something to get kind of darker but it won't because as I keep going over it with a darker color, it's removing some of the colors underneath sometime. But if you just kind of work with it, you can really take advantage of that aspect of the, uh, that property of the alcohol inks on certain card, you know, start stocks. But see that right there? Okay, I don't like that line so strong. So let's, you know, dissolve some of that with some lighter color and spread that around. Let's see right there? All right. All right, let's take a look in the um, bridge. See how, how much shadow got into these areas, okay? This is looking a little bit anemic, so this is a sepia, okay? I'll color some of these planks and maybe leave some of them as is. There's some shadow. This covered bridge has this window right here. Let me fill in that area. I don't think it'd be so light in there. Look at those little window areas. Now let me come into them with a little bit of green too. Like, you know, we're seeing some of the green of the uh, trees in the background too. What is this? Pale green barely visible. Yeah, we'll use that one later. Okay, let me go, let me get a little more bold with this coffee, okay? Let's approach that. Ooh, that one's really dark, huh? But let's use it, let's use it on the inside of this um, covered bridge. Okay, I'm just putting, I'm just applying a little bit here and there. It is really dark. Let's use some of this on the shadow right here underneath the eave. I'll put this on some of these planks like this. Look how terrible that looks. <laughs> right? It looks terrible. But you don't worry about it because we can just take a lighter version. Brownish gray, whatever. Brown. Go back to your um, pale orange or biscuit or any of those colors. This one's a brownish gray, but watch this right here. We can take that, and now what we're doing is we're just kind of spreading that around, okay? So it's going with dark and spread around with light. Lighter. It doesn't have to be the lightest color, okay? It's like, it's like really kind of spreading around. You can make like wood and things look really aged. Now this one is the lighter color to that um, I, I, I already forgot the name of that last one that I used. But this one is the lighter version to that. But maybe, see I'm putting some of this up right here in the front. I'll go with a, with a lighter color to this one. So let's go with this, I don't know, let's see. I keep putting away the pens that I'm using here. Apricot, let's go back to this apricot and go in here and spread brownish gray around now too, okay? So you can always go back. It's not like, okay, I'm using that one color and okay, I'm done with it, you know? You kind of go back and kind of utilize them, you know, to the full advantage. Maybe it got too dark in some of these areas, so I'll go in with this one and I'll just kind of apply it like that. I'm kind of dissolving and wiping away 
some of that color in there. All right, now different bridges have different types of roofs. You know, if you live in those areas and you have that around, you can kind of color it within the color scheme of that bridge near, you know, that you've seen to, you've been to, you visit once in a while or whatever. Okay, all right, so that is that brown in there. It still needs a little bit of a, you know, kind of tending to. Oh, as yes, I'm doing that, I should have been doing this too. Let's go in this um, area down here on this road. This road's looking a little anemic, so let's apply some of this shadow down here. Okay. Around here. Kind of going on the perimeter of like this. And these are little, I have these little textures within the road, too. See that? Okay. It looks terrible when you just apply it like that, but you just go back into your lighter form, okay? And now, let's mix that out and blend it into your piece. As we start doing this, one thing that I kind of like about, or I really like about alcohol inks is you can almost get kind of that feeling of like almost like watercolors or, or you know, some sort of painting type of vibe <laughs> from that. To me, it's easier than watercolors. I, I love the watercolor look. Um, and the spontaneity of it, and just the, the layering, but um, I'm not really great at that uh, style of real spontaneous marks, you know, and getting it right, you know, within that swoosh. That's why I get really love it. I love looking at it, so I'm not, you know, practiced at it. All right, so see that right down there? See how we just kind of blend it out, that other uh, brownish gray. All right, let's start going in with this and these trees in here and let's see what we can do in here. Boy, that looks really bad, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm getting a little bit more bold. I think of it as being a little bit more conservative with this um, type of color scheme, uh, tree color scheme or, you know, color usage in my previous photo stamping pieces because I haven't done this before, so... Uh, or I haven't done it in a long time. I used to use alcohol pens way back when, when I was in college for a couple assignments. They didn't really want us using that type of thing, but I did on a couple of projects that were wide open in terms of media. And uh, I was blending things around, which is really fun. But um, anyway, I'm not really practiced at this. Okay, now I'm going in with some orange. That was a little bit more of a reddish orange. So adding on quite a lot of that. I'm going to add some of this down in my grassy areas as well because, you know, you do get um, kind of bushes kind of relating to, um, you know, the colors that are happening uh, within the trees and everything like that. I find it quite beautiful ground cover, you know, changing with the seasons as well. Let's go back to that biscuit here now, okay? Or you can go with the green, whatever, you know, that pale green one would be cool. Actually, let's try this yellow green right here. Oh, not the chisel tip. All right, now let's go in and let's start blending away, or blending into those really bright, super bright and darker kind of red blotches. And this is where kind of the mixing and blending of those colors will come into play. <laughs> and someone that's really good at, you know, color blending with these, or, you know, there might be a, something that I'm doing completely, you know, I don't know about wrong, but you know, there might be a, like a better way to do it than I. Feel free to comment in the comment section. 
But anyways, you see where that's kind of coming into play. Now I'm starting to, one thing that's occurred to me is I'm starting to lose some of my lighter areas up there that I thought I kind of established, you know, with my dye-based inks, you know, those first ones. So let me see if I can go back in, and in this blending process, I'll just, yeah, okay, I can just kind of go back in here and paint, you know, stay within, a, see how dark this is right here? See, I'll just go like that, and see how it's lighter again, right in that little area. Very few times in kind of paper crafting and stamping in general using colors, can we do some sort of subtractive process within a given area or object? Okay, you can do bleaching or something like that, but just using the same media that you're using, you can't do it with dye-based inks. You dye-based inks, you apply and you apply and you apply, you get darker and darker and darker. Well, this one right here, you can get darker and darker and darker, but you can also go back in to reveal light. Now, I'm not trying to erase everything. I'm just trying to reveal some of those light areas within that given space. And what I'm doing, I'm not going to be removing the dye-based inks, but as I'm doing this, I'm kind of pushing around that alcohol ink that's sitting on the top of that dye and I'm able to reclaim the lighter areas underneath by kind of spreading that alcohol ink around, okay? And that is really fun. It's a really fun process. You can use your blender, you know, that's what your blender one is for. I don't really use the blender too much. Um, I mean, I certainly could, but I'm not really trying to remove everything completely when I'm doing this. I'm just looking to kind of blend things in, so if I'm blending things in, just in terms of my thought process, is I'm, I'm going to use a color that I want to blend it in with, so why not use a color? Just use a lighter one that's in a that given area, so you're not just removing everything completely with clear, you know, alcohol. So it looks a little bit better, huh? See that? You just kind of move that around, but that that looks a lot better than just specific areas straight out of the pen, okay? It, everything's kind of incorporated and blended in with one another. See it right here? Um, this is where I go with this lighter color like this, and see how it reveals that lightness in there. It's, not, it's a really fun process. It's kind of scary in some ways when you put down that darker tone, it's like, ugh. You know, you get that kind of visceral reaction. But if you know kind of what's kind of coming in terms of your capabilities with the medium, um, it's not really a big deal of what something might look like initially. And see it down here. I don't know if you can get some of this little bit of an orange down here too and kind of mix that in. All right, now this stamp along type of thing, I know it's going to kind of extending out. I usually like to go much shorter in terms of the stamp alongs, but I'm just kind of taking this to the extreme. Plus I'm really having fun just kind of, you know, working the forms. Let me get a little bit, sometimes I like to do my roof shade it a little bit differently, you know, so it looks like some light is hitting it in a different way. Way. See, I kind of did that darker, then I'm going back into it with a lighter beige, huh. Adding a little bit of texture like that. See, so you can take advantage of that kind of uh, um, tone or tonal kind of, I don't know, whatever, whatever you'd call it, uh, tonal transition thing. <laughs> it's when that ink kind of dissolves. And then the, sometimes you get this little ring around here where it's kind of built up with the ink and it's a little bit darker with alcohol inks. Okay, now I'm going into this brick down below here. 
underneath the bridge. And see, like in those little details, I put little blocks. You can color kind of a block a little bit of a different color than another one. Just for that little bit of detailing. I can go into my rocks down here. Below. And I'm just kind of hitting some areas in the shadows. I'm just reiterating the shadows. Not completely. You know, it doesn't have to be that careful at all. See, there's, there's some rocks down here in my meadow. I'm just kind of... Or not the meadow, I don't know. The bank, I guess. And I'm hitting that with a little bit of uh, some gray. You can use just a darker beige in the brown areas if you want to. This is just a really light gray. What is this? Warm gray. Looks more like taupe to me or something. You can see he's kind of adding this around like so. And on my bridge, kind of the those bricks as it moves back in three dimensions underneath the bridge. I'm making those areas darker because it is darker on the design, so just follow suit with your coloring. This is a uh, brownish gray again. I think I want some of that brownish gray on my roof here. It's looking too kind of mono color. There's a warm gray. Another one. It's a different value of warm gray, so maybe go underneath here a little bit. Let's do this right here. Let's put a little bit of shadow underneath the wood part of that, so we'll say that maybe that's not quite flush with the, uh, the pillars, you know. And you just kind of keep mixing it around. Every time you apply a dark, if it kind of stands out too much, just go back in and mix it in a little bit. Okay, let's take a look down this water down here. I haven't forgotten about the water. Oh, here's an aquamarine. This one is a pastel blue. Let's try those ones. And let's just generally try to get it keep it within that little water area. Don't be afraid of going over some of those rocks and losing it. That's fine. Okay, something like that. I think that's about enough. And I'll leave some of those areas out there. This one's a pale blue right here. Now I'll go into that blue and I'll kind of spread that blue around a little bit. It's not really spreading around very much because it's the first color that I laid down so it's not really built up yet. But you can just kind of stick with it and spread it around like so. Okay, now this blue, you wouldn't think to... Eh, for some reason my camera is shutting down. I should have tons of memory on here. But anyway, I'm going into this area here and bringing in some of that universal tone, okay? Maybe this is a little bit of water on my road, but it's really more to or for kind of unification in terms of my color schemes, okay? I, you know, I wouldn't put it over everything, but just see that little tinge in there makes it so that there isn't this isolated application of a given color in just in one area of the scene. Okay. And I think that kind of brings a little bit more continuity to the piece. <laughs> I'm always kind of forgetting to color. I'm usually not coloring like this in really specific areas, like stamping something out and then coloring it. Um, I'm usually doing my kind of vast areas of uh, dye-based inks, but I do find this really fun to do. 
It's kind of taking me us all way back when we're coloring things in, isn't it? All right, I'm, so I'm putting this little sandy shore in here on the other side of the, uh, the stream. So that kind of little strip there kind of relates to this one over here. lighten up some of this area in here. Touch. Okay. All right. We have that going in here. The wood paneling on this looks a little bit rough to me. Let me go in with some of this lighter. Maybe I'll do it from the bottom up like this. Yeah, it actually looks pretty good. I'll kind of lighten it up from the bottom up so it's like the shadows being cast from above. Like that. Kind of like, like dripping down. You know, that, I don't know, the rust and whatever from nails, maybe, and weathering. Okay, let's do this. Let's try the same thing right here. Let's. This is a apricot again. Yeah, looks pretty good. It's like one more kind of application of uh, some ink in here. Just a lighter one, just kind of unifying things from kind of a textural standpoint. Okay, so I think that looks okay. We do have some other things that we're going to do, some other little tricks on here. Now, I'm not doing really too much in the sky. I, I guess you can if you want to bring in some like really pale blue in here or something like that. This is one's really, really light. But I have plans for that area up there for us. Okay. Okay, that one's you barely see anyway. But let's take a look in here and... Uh, Let's see if we can bring in some other types of texturing in here. Look at this thing right here. <laughs> okay. So, let's take a look at our gel pens. Now, a lot of you aren't going to have, like, colored gel pens, but if you do... The gel pens that I'll be using are colors that are out of my color scheme. So, pastel pinks, pastel orange, pastel yellow, white, um, shuttle art that, you know, I was using their pens over there. They also have a 180 color set with 180 refills cost me $25. It's like 10 cents a pen or something like that. It's, it's hard to say because how much is the, uh, you know, the, the, the extra, you know, um, refill worth, you know, or something like that. But it's, I don't know, it's like a dime each or something like that. So it's really a, a small investment. Oh, before I go in with some of my extra little touches, I, I just have my little tiny rock stamp here. If you have something like this that you want to bring into the uh, the mix, it's just a little bit of extra texturing on my road. Like this. Okay, see that down there? It's kind of a fun little texture. You can even bring it into your grassy area if you want to. Um, I can bring in some of this right here. Some of those extra um, foreground elements, and I'm just doing them in black dye based ink again. I'm, not, I'm never sure about how this is going to lay down on my alcohol inks. I know how it stamps on photo paper. We're, I'm not really not stamping it on photo paper anymore because I've laid down so much of that alcohol ink on top, so I'm really stamping dye on top of alcohol, which is water on top of alcohol. Sometimes it doesn't stick so well, but we'll see how this emulsion does. It's okay. It's very, very light in value. 
which means that um, the ink isn't transferring from stamp to paper as well as it would um, on stamp to paper. Okay. So stamped alcohol, it's very, it's kind of light, but it is darker than the background. So, I mean, I think it looks okay. So like that, you can even stamp this. You can do something like, like a green in the foreground and black, you know, for a little bit of variation. Let's do that right here. Let's see if we have a, a really, oh, let's see. I don't know if I have a real bottle green, like really dark green. Okay, let's skip the green. <laughs> I was going to do it in a bottle green, which is a really dark green. I don't want this to be in like a, you know, like a grass green or something like that. I, I don't know. It'd be okay. I just don't want all that form showing through my grass. I want this to be fairly dark. Okay, so we have that. And let's come in with this overhanging branch. Oh, I'll, I'll show you what I do with this one right here. Let's test this out and see what it looks like. So I'm stamping this out in black. And just stamp it out in black if that's... You know, you don't have like a brush marker like this, but let's do a little experiment on here and let's take a red pen and let's color some of these leaves. Don't color them all, just kind of bring a little tinge into it. And let's see if we can't get a little bit of this reddish tone into the impression. It just depends on how much you kind of wipe off of the black. So you want it kind of incorporated in there, though. Okay, so I'll come over like this. I don't have too much space up top there, so I won't go into my trees too much. Well, we'll come into it a little bit. Hey, you know, it's all kind of an experiment, and we want to play around with it. Actually, that looks really good. <laughs> See right there? And there's that red going over that. Um, but I don't have too much space, and I really want to bring in some pigment ink into that area, so um, I'm going to leave some of that as is right in here. And that's why I didn't go too much with my um, blue up there or something like that. I want to reserve a lot of the white for some other colors to come. Okay. I'm just using a little portion of it that's like I don't know, a sixth of the image. It's really a very small amount. And I should have been doing this on some of my photo stamp. I should have been incorporating some of the colors into these overhanging tree limbs. Let's see right here. Okay, I'm just using a tiny little portion like that. It's the ultimate thing in scenic stamping is you can use tiny portions of certain designs and it doesn't look like, oh, that looks weird because you'd see that out in nature. See that red right there? Maybe that red that stands up a little bit too much. Let me go with the black in front of it. Okay, let's go like this. Let's multi-layer it with some black and red. Like that. Okay. All right. Be interesting. You can even have it. If I didn't do those reads down here, I could have come up with this down here too. Next time. Not that it would have been better, but you know, just as an experiment. Okay. So we have that. Let's go back to those gel pens. Okay. If you have them, I think this looks okay as is too, but I'll show you what these gel pens do. And, like I said, uh, now these are the Univol Signo ones. You know, I could grab out my uh, shuttle art ones too. But, okay, here's the thing. Now, remember how I said retain some areas of light in there? Well, I didn't in some cases, so I just reclaimed it by going over it with a lighter tone with the uh, alcohol inks using it like a blender tool you know my lighter colors but the reason why we're doing some of that too is because you see in these lighter areas let's zoom in real close for this um, next step here 
see where these little areas of light are down here? In the grass, and the trees and whatnot. Well, when I apply some of this tone, or these touches, with the alcohol ink, I'm applying it on the top sides of those areas that are light. Because this is a light color, unless it's lighter than the, the uh, color that we're using in gel. I think I've gotten darker, as dark or darker than the color of my gel pen down there. So it's showing up a little bit. It'll show up more over the, some darker areas. Okay, now this is orange, so it's not super light. But right on the top sides of these objects, okay. So what you do is you shade underneath objects like trees and you highlight the top areas of them. Okay, here, let, let me move on to my next color. You'll be able to see yellow much better. Okay, but do you see these forms right here? See that form right there and how it's shaded underneath and the top of it is light, okay? So here's the top areas of them, okay? Right up here. Unless we've just completely made it completely dark down here in the coloring process. But you see these areas right here? They still exist in terms of light and dark. So let's go into them and on the top sides. Now this yellow stands out much more because it's much lighter than that orange. Okay, so I just start adding some of that right around in these areas. So it's kind of clustering it, then I kind of taper it off a little bit. Use more on the top, and then as it moves down, I use less. Okay, so kind of group and then spread it around cluster it, and then taper it off, you know, a little bit more space in between. Kind of makes the um, leaves shimmer in the, the lighting within the, the, the color scheme or the lighting scheme, doesn't it? Doesn't it give it more texture and value in those areas too? It looks more dimensional, I think. So these little dots like that, although I'm adding quite a few little dots, it really changes the spirit of it. So you can see these trees right over here. I'll show you what they look like here. See that? And here's one that doesn't have it. I mean, it looks okay, but you add this little bit into it like this. And I think it just kind of, it livens up that area a touch. It kind of brings light into that darkness, even though it wasn't very dark. Okay, see that right in there? You can even do it on your grasses down here. Maybe not the ones in shadow, but if it's light enough back in there, you can kind of highlight some of those areas like that. See that a little bit down there? Okay, let's look at it right in here. There's a little tuft of grass, and I've drawn this into the designs, okay? So it always has these little, this oscillation of light and dark within the design. And it's for you to, you know, take your cues from in terms of, you know, what you can do. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's there at least. I get. I like to give people options, as many options as possible. And that's what you want out of a design. The designs that kind of, scenic stamping designs at least, the ones there, you don't want the ones that are gonna lock you down and not have as many possibilities available to you after you do it. It makes it a little bit more limiting, okay? so. Adding this down to this grass. It's kind of bringing the grass to life. I'm just looking. Now, things are, are kind of developed by the, um, the inks that we've used as well. Where does it get darker? You know, where does it stay light? Or where did 
I don't know, where did it end up? A lot of times it just, these pieces and the surfaces and coloring air, you know, schemes and areas within a given space, it, they can take on a life of their own. Um, which, for some, might get a little bit frustrating early on. It's like, I don't know where this is going. They want to know where something's going. They want to replicate um, a scene that they've seen or a card that they've seen. So they want it exactly like that. But when you start to do something like this, it's a little bit more um, kind of spontaneous in some ways. <laughs> and things just happen. And you have to kind of... I wouldn't say you have to, but um, it's kind of fun to let a piece go in the direction that it just seems to want to go to and to feel free about doing that so um, it's a little bit more jazz than classical maybe in some ways it might start off you know classical you know in terms of classical music and keeping things to a T but it's also quite liberating in terms of not being locked down to a given set, you know, uh, gripping of rules or whatever. Okay, now this is I'm going on with white now. I'm doing this in the same area that I did with the colored pens. This might represent just lighting. Some of those other ones might represent kind of shimmering leaves. Kind of when I go down to highlighting, I might go back into some of these rocks and on the top sides of some of these rocks that got color on them because I wasn't being real careful about it and didn't care to be careful because I knew I can come back to little touches like this and reintroduce light back into those areas. So on the top sides of some of these rocks in the water, I can put a little shimmer down there like so. Okay, now we see this, um, our mill too. And if you didn't retain some of these areas, you colored your little fence right here, just go back in and just color it right back in with a white gel pen like this. If I didn't mention it, this one's the Uniball Signo White. I find it be a really good pen. It's the 0 0.7. I really like the 1.02. 0.7, I guess it's millimeters. So it's fairly you know, fine tipped. All right, let's apply this into our tree area as well. Coloring on, uh, starting off with a white piece of paper um, takes a lot longer, <laughs> I'm finding, than photo stamping, where all the things and the you know the the background is kind of established and color already. But this is fun too. I, I like being able to take you know something and go on a journey with it from beginning to end. You know where nothing's kind of established. You see this. Um, rooftop here. I hope my stomach growling isn't coming out on the sound, but it might be. I felt like stamping this morning, so I didn't even eat. I've been so busy working on uh, some designs uh, or inventory and some orders in the past few days, so a couple days. When I don't stamp for a couple days, it feels like it's been like a week, or it feels like it's been two weeks sometimes. Okay, so going into these areas right here and kind of adding this little texturing. See, we have these little rocks down here, right? So you can kind of add the same texture down here with white back into those areas. Just anywhere like that. All right, 
so look at that shimmer that's kind of happening throughout the piece. Oops, here we go. So get down there in the grass. It's quite a bit, huh? Um, as I was doing that, see that blue that's in that water area? I'm going to bring some of that blue into my grass, okay? I'm doing it kind of in the darker area or in the area that's almost the same value as this blue. So it, it, it doesn't stand out too much, all right? I can kind of see it, but it, it's that continuity thing. I just want to bring a little of that blue into another area. And it, to the eye, it just kind of blends in because I'm doing it in an area that's as dark as the blue. So it's just a little bit of change in um, hue within that given area. But do you see that down there? See that little touches of blue like right in there? It's subtle, right? So when we hold it out like that, I don't think you're saying, oh my gosh, there's, look at all those little blue dots. But I think that that little touch in those areas brings that kind of visual continuity to that blue that's down there. All right, now we've gone through this whole process. Do you have a white pigment ink pad and cotton ball? I think a lot of you do, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to use this for this little extra special effect in here to bring extra lighting and texture into to the piece. So you know how we're kind of doing some subtractive um, techniques in here using the alcohol inks by going into a darker area, coloring it out, and blending something out, spreading that ink around in some cases, removing some ink, okay? Now this is going to be an additive process to lighten something up, okay? So we're not subtracting. All right, so you can see all of my, my test little things right here. Anytime you get a new cotton ball and you're dabbing it into that, kind of spread it around a little bit. Don't sop it up too much, but you don't want these big splotchy applications of ink. So what you want to do is you kind of want to tap a lot of that off, okay? And what it's doing is it's kind of spreading it around on the cotton as well. And you'll see, I, if I tilt it up there, there's another blob of it. So I'm trying to find all the areas where there's you know, quite a bit of it. And just to kind of push it back into the cotton and spread it around. Okay. See that right there? It's barely applying now. When I go like that, you can't hardly, you can barely see anything, right? <laughs> Maybe I've taken off too much. Here, let me put a little bit more on that again. Okay. So you want to get it to where it's barely applying, okay? Now don't get impatient. If you start applying this, this is, this is what happens with people. They start applying it because we've taken off so much. Then they squeeze it out and they get a big blob, okay? Don't do that. All right, let's, let's zoom in here again. All right, so I've retained a lot of the white up here, okay? And that's where I'm going to apply some of that, okay? Now watch this tree. Let me let me put a little bit on one tree and not on the other, okay? So you can kind of see. See that right there? See how it's light right there? And this one's crisp, okay? I'm going to do this on right around where dark meets light. See that? It's just kind of tinty. That, that looks like light is hitting it from back there now, doesn't it? But I'm not putting it everywhere, okay? We can put it on around our foreground branch too. See, there's that little peekaboo. All of our scenes are going to be different, yours and mine, because we have different areas of light and dark, okay? You, you might have stamped your trees much higher where you might not have it, or you might have stamped it lower where you have more sky, then you can apply, you know, it accordingly. But where I'm applying it is just, okay, I'm starting to spread that. That right there was a little bit wet, so I started spreading around a little bit of that. Uh, red in there, so I'm going to stay away from that a little bit for a little bit more time. Okay. Yep. 
yeah, that red on there. It was so juicy from that red pad. I mean, that red pen. Okay, so be a little bit careful about that. I think I'm safe in here because that's just that black. And so I didn't use that. That red part is down this way, so I'm going to be a little bit careful about my application right in there so I don't spread that red around. Okay, I, put, I took a lot of that off right there. <laughs> but here, maybe I took off a little bit too much ink. So see, I can just kind of rub this off and I can remove some of that pigment ink that's been applied. I'll just brush it off like so. Okay, that was a little bit too much right there, but see where that light is kind of hitting back in that area? See, isn't that kind of nice? It, it kind of, it transitions things and it softens things up a little bit too. It's, it's a different texture that we've introduced now. We have soft lighting, right? I'm being careful around that. That red right there is really juicy, so... But look at that, how it... It looks like that branch is in the light because it's being illuminated differently. Okay, so I think that's about as much as I'm going to use up there, but let's take a look down here. Kind of that soft lighting opportunity. It's really fun adding this pigment ink right around in the water. Okay, now don't do it everywhere, okay? Like this, okay? It's sometimes that's a little bit too much. Okay, but look, let's, I have a little bit too much ink on here right now. So just accordingly. Still a little bit too much. Let me blot some of this off. Okay. Light lighter touch. I'll go with the lighter touch too. But see this kind of foggy, kind of misty feel. So I'll kind of taper that up a little bit. So I'll use a little bit more down here. Tap very lightly around in here. If you like it, you can certainly add more. But kind of do it gradually. So you have a lot of control over it. See how it, I put some of it down here in that, uh, at the base of those kind of columns or whatever pillars. I can actually have it coming up into my um, covered bridge a little bit too. Now let's add some of it right around in here and soften up these transitions right here too. Kind of where light meets dark, okay? I'm not adding it in an area that's really dark because you wouldn't have that illumination because you're saying if an area is really dark, you're saying that light isn't over in that area. See that right there? It's kind of enveloping the different imagery, isn't it? So what is it doing? You know, we were talking about kind of unification through color. You know, universal colors, there's oranges, greens, browns, browns in here, browns and greens down here. There's that red from up there, down there. Now we're just kind of giving them a texture that's kind of in common in all areas. We have it in the foreground, we have it in the background, around our subject matter. I'm adding a little bit more of this than I thought I was going to, but I really like it, so, you know, just kind of keep building it up. But do you see what I'm doing? I'm doing a really light layer at a time, so, you know, there's a lot of control over it. Take a look at it, you know, your piece and your given areas once in a while to get a feel for what you're doing. Because sometimes we can start doing this and it's like we hold it out at arm's distance and, oh my gosh, you know, way too much of whatever it might be. So I would say just kind of take it in a nice gradual uh, fashion and then you won't get these surprises kind of like popping up on, on you. Like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? You know, because it's not like I go like that. 
and it's like, oh my gosh, I made a mistake there, but, you know, it takes a little bit of time to kind of build it up. And you have a lot of control over it that way. Okay, let's add like that. I don't know, maybe I'm adding too much. But um, yeah, I'm having a ton of fun at it, so if I added too much, um, I made up for it in the fun <laughs> of application. Okay, let me try to put a little... Uh, I'll put a little bit of here in the foreground. Let's say that some of these reeds, you know, are kind of enveloped in fog as well. Kind of add it down like so. All right, now, like I said, if you've added too much, here's just a clean cotton ball or a paper towel or whatever. You can kind of go in and use this like an eraser now. And you can kind of dampen and remove some of that you know, this is kind of like fine-tuning right here. It's like an eraser or whatever. You can, you won't be erasing the ink work though. You'll just be removing some of the uh, the pigment ink on there. But all right, that kind of unified things even more from a textural standpoint now. And you've increased the textural range of the piece by having certain things nice and crisp. You know in addition to things that are very soft. So it's one of those opportunities in rubber stamping that you can actually go in and make a textural change with a given media. And I do like that texture. I do like having a nice wide range of textures within my piece. Not physical textures like, oh, this is bumpy or something like that, but visually, okay? We have something that's crisp and a part of it that's soft. And areas that are crisp, like these reeds, and areas that are soft, or there's areas within those reeds that are a little bit softer too. So you kind of go into like pastels and sharp, you know, pastels and then brighter tones and whatnot. Um, it does a lot of different things in there, and it also represents lighting because you have these areas within this space that are illuminated by light. What you're saying is there's moisture in the air, and that area has been illuminated by light hitting that suspended moisture. And where the moisture is the most thick, like fog or whatever, that's going to have the, uh, the lightest kind of effect when light hits it, you know, and then there's that reflective quality of uh, water. Okay, so anyways, I hope you enjoyed the scene. It's a bit, you know, of a longer, you know, type of thing. It's certainly faster on uh, photo stamping because you have all those colors already established in here, but you really do have the opportunity to get really control your world when you're stamping on top of white paper. Now, that was just kind of my experiment and my demonstration on how I use alcohol inks too. So in just recap, I start light. I start to build up those, you know, kind of um, layers with the lighter tones. Then I hit it with the darker tones, you know, where I want some spot coloring and some brightness. But I go back in with my lighter tones and just kind of spread it around. And one of the things about glossy cardstock and or photo paper um, using um, alcohol inks is you can really spread things around after the fact, you know, it's one of those times when you apply something, it can actually be removed in terms of a, a type of ink. And I, this is, I haven't done it on photo paper until this scene right here, but I found the photo paper worked just great, you know, in terms of this type of look. It's a little bit more cumbersome when you're doing um, a staining ink like dye-based inks on photo paper, but if you're going to be doing kind of a lot of um, alcohol ink types of coloring things, then the photo paper works fine. And this will be sprayed in the end. One of the things, if you haven't watched another video of mine, a lot of times I like to reserve my, um, my foreground imagery um, to be stamped in a versifying pigment ink, okay? Now I didn't try it on this brand of photo paper, so I don't know if it's the same for all of them, but when I did it on a photo print, that pigment ink just never dried. I mean, several days later, it, I could wipe it right off. If, if I took a, you know, a 
paper towel or something, I, I'm pretty sure that image would just wipe off clean. It was so wet. So dye-based inks, just your standard dye-based inks on here. And uh, anyways, you can get some really good results that way. Anyways, I hope you had a good time. If you stamped along with me and or, you know, you played around with your uh, alcohol ink uh, techniques in there in terms of blending and whatnot, I could certainly learn a lot probably from uh, most of you that are doing that, but this is how I use it in this particular application. And, uh, I don't know, it's just a lot of fun playing around with that and being able to do that subtractive type of aspect to the, um, the inks. I hope you liked this video. If you liked it, I hope you like, share, and subscribe. And if you have any questions, as always, just drop me a note in the comment section.